Hello and welcome to Single Parent Success Stories. Today's guest come to us today from Los Angeles, California. Her name is Elham Raker, and she's a board certified pediatrician and parent coach with a virtual platform. Her goal is to help parents deal with overwhelm of parenting by providing reassurance, guidance, and peace of mind, all from the comfort of your home. She is also a mom. She has a boy and a girl. Welcome, Elham. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As you said, I'm, fine. I'm glad we, we found the time to make this happen. Yeah, yeah. So please tell us, how did you become a pediatrician? What kind of drove you into that? Was it always your passion? Uh, yes and no. I think from a very young age, and my daughter actually asked me this the other day, you know, she asked me, what did I want to be when I was little? Um, did I know I wanted to be a doctor? And I just remember that I always wanted to help people. Um, and that's really probably one of the biggest attributes of physicians. I feel like universally when you ask them, um, we all kind of have that universal feeling of just wanting to help people. Um, why I chose medicine, I think partly because my own pediatrician, I had known him uh, from when I moved to America when I was about four and a half till I went to see him till I was in med school. So till I was like 26 and <laughs> um, definitely his oldest patient, he finally kicked me out and said, it's just not okay for you to come to my practice anymore. Um, so I had this relationship with him and, and I think I really appreciated that and wanted to um, continue that, you know, to have that relationship with others and with other families. And yeah, that's how I ended up with um, choosing that field. Okay, love it. Thank you. What are some of the things that you, like you see your patients or your, your clients with, what are some of the common things that you notice? Um, in pediatrics, I think the, you know, we often see just mostly the cold and the this and the that. That's probably the most common like office visit. Um, I think what parents most worry about is just knowing that they're doing things right. Um, you know, they, they have like the best of inten intentions and the best heart. And I, I think part of the reason that I love pediatrics also, other than the kids who are amazing, I think as parents, we do everything we possibly can for our kids versus ourselves. We don't, right? Like I have never missed a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment, a follow-up appointment for my kids, but I can't say that about myself. Mm -hmm. So um, I just really appreciate how much parents are willing to give for their kids and how, you know, how much they care for them and, and that love. So I, I think for me, part of what led me to what I'm doing is providing a, a way that parents can ask more of those questions that maybe get missed in the typical office setting. You know, our, our office visits are getting shorter and shorter, unfortunately. The wait times are getting longer, it's harder to get in. And I just thought this way we could have limitless kind of time and appointments and, and chat, you know, just like we are right now right. in a comfortable way. And, and when things come up or when you're just unsure about something, I don't think Google or Facebook should be the place to get answers. Right, right. Yeah. Oftentimes we're looking for something quick and we'll, we, yeah, we'll go to Google, we go to that and then we'll challenge the doctor like, why do you have this type of diagnosis? So how do you came up with this particular uh, situation? So yeah, yeah totally. exactly. What kind of advice can you share for single parents? Um, you know, I, I think depending on whether you're co-parenting or it's just on your own, those are kind of two different things to consider. Um, well, my biggest advice. Yeah, let's oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's do a high code on your own and then the co-parenting, how it's Yeah, different. so I think on your own, if, well, I think for any parent, honestly, the, my biggest thing is don't doubt yourself. You're doing a great job. You're exactly what your child needs. 
So, you know, go into that relationship, that situation, knowing that you are the right person for the job. And, you know, I, I think as a single parent, most likely you don't have, um, there isn't going to be someone working and you can stay at home, right? So most single parents are going to be at work. And I think that one of the hardest things is, am I doing enough? Um, am I there enough for my child? And I'm, I'm a really big fan of quality time, not quantity time. I truly believe that if you can set up, you know, meaningful minutes in the day with your child, that means so much more than just being there all day and not actually interacting with them. So make sure that it's enjoyable for you. You know, I think you need to have routines set up really well because that's going to make your life easier and your child's life easier in the way that things will be predictable. So as a single parent, I think that's even more important because you know you don't have someone else to kind of bounce off of if something goes wrong or, or... so I think having a schedule is really important and finding support, you know, even single or not. I think having um, babysitters that you can rely on, having backup you can rely on, whether it's family, friends, whatever it is, don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to get support. Um, it's not a sign of weakness. I think all of us need that. It's unfortunate that we truly don't grow up in a village anymore. I I do think we were meant to raise kids together. You know, I I do think that village that we all seek um, should exist, but it doesn't. So you have to make your own. So don't be afraid to find that village and, you know, whether it's paid help or a friend or whatever it is that you can switch off um, look for that when your child is little and can continue it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally, I love that idea, <laughs> having yeah. a village. <laughs> right, I think, you know, we all need that. I mean, I kind of grew up that way in my family with my grandparents and my aunts and, you know, my mom just was always at their house. Right. And I don't think I realized how special that was until now. Mm-hmm. Do you have that opportunity now with your own kids? A little bit. I don't live as close to my family as my mom lived to her family. They all lived within less than a mile of each other. Oh, wow, that's Um, great. But we're all still close, yes. All right. Well, what do you think of this scenario? Like, uh, do do do, do your kids play sports or do do they do any kind of activities? Yes. How much is it driven towards, like... uh, do you enforce them to participate or is it you more looking to them what are their interests and then enrolling them accordingly? Yeah, oh, that's a great, great question. You know, I think in, in this day and age, um, we are so pressured to put our kids into all these activities, right? Like every day they have to have something and it's for a single parent especially, that's a lot, right? You have to figure out how to get them there. First of all, it it's costs money, all these different activities. Then you have to figure out how to physically get them there and how to physically get them home and also get them dinner and then also make sure they get to bed on time. So my first uh, piece of advice on that is do not over schedule. You may have a child that says yes to everything, but it's your job as a parent to realize A, your own limits and B, their limits and say, you know what, we're going to do one activity at a time, pick your favorite. (laughs) If you're really up for it, you know, maybe two activities, but I I would seriously just think about your own bandwidth and don't overschedule. If your child's not interested in anything, you know, we had, our kids were um, not really interested in sports when they were younger. We put them in basketball and baseball and soccer. And, and um, it, it just was like any time a ball came at them, they were just not interested, you know? And it, okay. was, it wasn't working. Okay. So we kept searching. I, I kept searching for something that would work for them. I didn't make them do things that didn't fit for them or that they weren't enjoying. Um, they both ended up doing swimming. And, you know, we thought that was good because there's no competition. Nobody's throwing anything at you. It's all on your own time. 
Right. Um, but to us, the reason why we pushed it was because being physically active was important. And both my husband and I, you know, run exercise and we just wanted to instill that in, in our kids that, that it's an important thing to do. It doesn't matter what. So we started them swimming and they are now both playing water polo. So you never know, you know, we definitely can push water polo on them in any way. They both just ended up really liking that sport. Um, it, and it's a tough sport with balls. So, <laughs> so you, you never know, right? You never know. Don't pigeonhole your kids just because they don't seem like they're into something. Um, if your kid is truly not athletic, I, I don't want to say they're not athletic. I think all kids have potential to be anything. But if they really just don't like sports, um, just find something physical for them to do, even if it's like walking as a family or going to the park or playing basketball as a family. I just think that, that the importance of exercise mm -hmm. and then find something that they just would like. It doesn't have to be sports, but I think being a part of something when you're growing up is really important, you know, so it could be the chess club, it could be drama, but something they have an affinity for. Um, they don't have to find it when they're so young, you know, just right. expose them to different things and um, don't get caught up. I, I think in this day and age, what I see more than anything else is parents doing, you know, this sport and that sport and the club sport and the the drama, club, you know, it's just like this layering of stuff and kids and adults, we all need downtime. I think that's something we really learned from the pandemic. Um, to appreciate our downtime. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I'm coming from a high court, uh, from the way when you have a boy, especially to do some kind uh -huh. of a sport related activity. So I enrolled my son in karate and we did go uh, before yeah. COVID. We were kind of consistent with COVID. It started video lessons then in person. It wasn't the same vibe anymore. And so yeah. now he is not interested into it. Uh, and I feel like I have to push him every time you have to go. It's a struggle. It's this, right. the, you know, the tension. Right, right. And you don't and want I'm, it to be that way because, right. hey, you're paying for this, right? That's what I always think about. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm paying for this and we're not enjoying it. And you right. want him to enjoy it. Um, I, I, we, My kids actually did karate when they were young too. And, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be great if they continued and became black belts, right? I would have loved that. But it wasn't their thing. It wasn't, right. it, it just didn't spark a joy in them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's our job to kind of keep searching for that right. thing. And, and it can get frustrating. And I remember when they were little and it was like, what's their thing? What are they going to like? Um, and, and I remember this funny commercial about, you know, like an Amex commercial about trying to find the thing that your kid likes and in the end I think the kid was playing music and the idea you know the whole like this lesson costs this much this lesson costs this much but finding something your kid likes is priceless mm -hmm. um so you know I, I think it's just I think it's our job as parents to kind of keep searching for that honestly to um find the right piece like a puzzle piece almost right Right. He, yeah. does, he does like puzzles. <laughs> We're putting yeah. puzzles together. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. been like that, like kind of yeah, searching. I also have a daughter. She's uh, 12 and my son is seven. So mm -hmm. with, the, with my daughter, we tried everything. The soccer and swimming. I think swimming was the most that we stuck on. And for seven years, uh, twice a week, I would like drive and yeah. make sure. And, yeah, she became a great swimmer. But other than that, kind of nothing stuck. Like she would participate yeah. and then it kind of falls off. There is no that genuine interest. So it's yeah. looking for that like. Yeah, and, and I think that's okay too. I mean, it could be that she just enjoys swimming, but she doesn't want to be on the swim team or she enjoys, you know, maybe it's just doing tennis once a week, but she's not going to be on the tennis team necessarily or play tennis in college, right? So I don't think, I, I don't think we have to, I don't think any of these things have to be what they do for a living or what they play in college necessarily. It's just something that brings them joy and it's, and it's something physical and it's something they can potentially do with friends. Um, so I, I think part of it is just removing that pressure of like, uh, you know, and I said, finding their thing, but it, it doesn't have to be 
this thing that sparks the ultimate joy. I think it can just be something that they enjoy, period. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like the idea of doing it with people, but I'm also an extrovert. So maybe, you know, for an introvert, I think doing a running, maybe the thing that they enjoy because it's something they can do on their own. So it, it's just finding something that you enjoy. It doesn't really have to be um, the sport or the thing that you do forever. I also think there's a lot of pressure on parents to find that thing at that young age, right? Like I remember talking to a a friend whose kids were playing hockey at a really young age. And she was like, oh, we found their thing. Well, a few years later, none of them are playing hockey and they're doing something different. So, you know, let them just be, let them figure it out, but just encourage um, things that you value. Like for us, we value physical activity because it's healthy and good for you doesn't matter what it is right right yeah yeah totally totally i do agree with physical exercise and i i kind of show, kind of try to show by example like i like walking i like exercising and hopefully yeah. they'll, they'll absorb some of that not what i talk about but like what they see in day to day exactly exactly i think that's the best thing and if you can schedule in like a family hike once a week or something like that that's even better because then you're getting some time to be connected and doing something physical um i was talking to a mom recently one of my clients and she was talking about going rock climbing with her daughter and how it was a time for them to connect it was a time for her to get her monkey (laughs) you know (laughs) climbing done somewhere other than her house right and um and she got physical activity which was really important to her and she wasn't always finding the time to do that so it could be like doing a class together something like that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah totally thank you what do you think what is the most important trait to instill in a child oh that's that's a good question um you know for me, and I know there's been a lot of talk about this during COVID, um, I would say resilience. I think that resilience has been thrown a lot, thrown a lot, thrown around a lot uh, the past year and a half. You know, like kids are resilient. Kids are resilient. They can get through this. And I think that's a little unfair. I think resilience is something we learn and something we can teach as parents. Right. But to just say kids are resilient you know, if kids were so resilient, then we wouldn't grow up into adults that needed therapy. So there's something about teaching that, but I do believe it's a really important trait to have. I I think it's like the number one thing that leads to success is that concept of not giving up. I will figure this out. Failure is not final. Um, it, It goes along with just having a growth mindset to me, you know, resiliency, growth mindset, um, that we can learn and grow. And just because I don't know how to do something right now, it doesn't mean that I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that is probably um, the most important trait. And as parents, we need to realize that it's something that we can teach you know, even if a kid seems a little bit more resilient, one kid than another, um, or one kid tends to give up easily, it doesn't mean that they can't learn that trait and become more of, um, more into the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think it's important in today's age that in the age of instant gratification, when you did something and it didn't work out and you immediately give up or throw a tantrum or (laughs) some other thing to kind of uh, work on that and uh, just like we exercise a muscle like a physical muscle we can exercise resilience muscle a hundred percent yeah as adults too we need to show our kids that we struggle with things that you know things didn't always come easy for us I remember learning to drive I thought it was the hardest thing in the world <laughs> and my mom laughed at me she's like um I think you'll be okay I'm like mom how am I going to remember how to turn on my signal and put it into drive and then look back and then look forward and then let you know I thought it was so complicated, but you know, look at you 40, now, probably yeah. zooming by 30, 30 years later, right. <laughs> it's something you don't even think about. So, yeah. um, I think it's just, you know, showing our kids that we struggle too. Totally. Totally. What do you want to be remembered by? 
Oh, oh, I haven't thought about that one. Um, um, I think I want to be remembered that I was caring and thoughtful. Um, they really try to put others ahead of me, but in a healthy way. <laughs> um, you know, not not giving myself up way, but in a way that I really try to think of others and what they need and be attentive. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I I strive to do and hope that people notice. Yeah, yeah. Is there a hey, cold? How was this year for you with the pand not just this year, but with pandemic and all? Did you see uh, any changes, any positives? Like, what were the benefits? Did you see any positive shifts in the pandemic? For me personally? Yes, yes. Um, for my life? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think just what I was saying about realizing that we don't have to be this go, go, go society, that mm -hmm. there is um, beauty in just being, and it's not just about what we do and what we produce. Um, I think I had a very hard time with that concept, and I'm, and I'm still working on it. Um, I'm very much like what's next, what's on the list, cross it off, you know, and the idea of just being is very hard for me, right? But we're not human doings, we're human beings. Right. So I think that was a really important lesson from um, the pandemic is once everything was shut down, there was nothing to do and there was nowhere to go. And we really had to be introspective. So the idea of being able to count on yourself and who you are inside that's the most important thing um yeah and in, in your practice with patients any... um it was hard it was hard kids had a very hard time with this um lots of i'd say um increase in anxiety mm -hmm. depression um eating disorders uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to see that for a while. We're going to see the, the, the fall of COVID kind of for years to come. We may not know exactly all the things that come from it mm -hmm. um, for a little while, but yeah, it was hard. That's why I think, you know, when we say kids are resilient, it, it was kind of an unfair um, statement. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not born that way. And to just throw something really hard at them was mm -hmm. was a really big expectation, I think. Not necessarily by parents. I don't think parents thought that. But I think just as a society, you know, when we closed down schools and when we said that they can't go out with their friends and they can't do this and that, mm -hmm. and we just kept saying, oh, kids are resilient. I think that was just, the, you know, and maybe we had to do those things, but it was just kind of an unfair thing to put on the kids. Yeah, I think it was a difficult uh, time for adults and kids especially like i had to yeah. learn uh, they went i don't know how in california but in new york when they first became virtual i had to learn the whole online system for, for managing and my son was in kindergarten like five-year-old on oh, the computer yeah. yes <laughs> so teaching yes. yourself first like what, what am i even doing and then yes. managing it all <laughs> Mm -hmm. I feel for the little ones, the ones that were in kindergarten, you know, yeah, you just had to sit with them. I mean, they, they couldn't sit on Zoom all day. That, yeah. That's a very unreasonable expectation for a five-year-old. Um, my kids were older, you know, they were in fifth and seventh grade, so they were more independent, but it was still very hard, especially for my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and the teachers didn't know what they were doing either. You know, they're all learning. So yeah. Um, it was hard. It was hard. It's, it's hard to see those things. Um, I do think our kids are going to be okay. I do think that quote unquote, they are resilient, but we, it's something we need to work on with them, you know, and not ignore and just say, oh, they'll be fine. Um, we need to help them <laughs> to get to the place that they'll be fine. Right. And, and every kid's going to be a little bit different, but um, looking at what they didn't get and what they needed and being there for them and supporting them um you know maybe therapy so right, yeah right, right 
what kind of therapy like play therapy talk therapy i think it depends on the age of the child and kind of what they're going through mm -hmm. you know but i think it's just being open to it as a parent that like yeah my my child may need to talk to someone um and just seeking that out right so um, the first best place to start is with your pediatrician and just saying, I'm noticing these behaviors and what do you think, right? And they can kind of help refer you to the right person in your community. Um, the nice thing about what we went through with COVID is you can potentially do some of these things online now. So even if you don't have someone in your community, depending on the age of your child, you can do it on Zoom. And I know for some older kids, it's been great because they don't have to miss school. Mm -hmm. They can do it, you know, at their lunch hour or um, early in the morning before school. It just, it's, it's opened up a little bit more flexibility. So, mm -hmm. right. yeah. Thank you. If people would love to find you or look more about your work, uh, where would they go? Um, so my website is askdrmom.com and there's a dash between doctor and mom. Mm -hmm. My Instagram is um, at askdrmom underscore. And I have a LinkedIn um, there, which will lead you to all the other places, mm -hmm. um, a blog, a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I, and I love to just educate and do you know fun things on Instagram so if you have any questions you can always also message me and would love to connect with you there thank you thank you so much for being here for offering your advice and sharing your expertise it was a pleasure to have you my pleasure thanks for having me